Uh, my name is uh, Olga Vilibuska. I'm the director of CIMAN. Uh, it's a pleasure to host this series and to start off this series of webinars that we run uh, with the CIMAN uh, Champions. And the CIMAN Champions Award is an initiative that CIMAN has launched back in 2010 to award outstanding individual achievements of our colleagues in the areas of teaching, the areas of research, responsible management education, institutional management, because we saw that there is a lot of wonderful experiences, ideas, projects that are so worthwhile to showcase and to share with the world. And we are very glad um, uh, to start um, this uh, series with the category of teaching because uh, also in Seaman teaching somehow was uh, one of the key priorities uh, also with the establishment of our INTA, International Management Teachers Academy back in 2000 to help develop teaching skills and practices and methodologies. And Dietmar is an alumnus of, in, of INTA himself. Marcin was involved with our other faculty and staff development project at tech seminars. So it, it's been great to work with both of you on different kinds of projects. And I think Dietmar is an even more special case because Dietmar comes from practice. And this is what we love to see in Simon. We love to have relevant management education to promote management education. So Dietmar was so inspired first by his MBA studies and then he joined IMTA and he started teaching and writing cases and winning our case writing competitions <laughs> and, and doing research. And with Marcin, we have worked, uh, I think first time in 2014 for our conference that was focusing on the, the topic of technologies and management education. And we've kind of continued this collaboration ever since. Who we have- that? In Budapest, that's right, on the Margaret <laughs> Island. <laughs> Budapest, Margaret Island, yeah. Uh, we have two colleagues, uh, two more colleagues from Simon with us, Jiva and Tiasha. Uh, Tiasha, could you also turn the camera? And um, it's good to have them with us because they are the ones who are doing all the work behind the scenes with the Champions Award. So Jiva has been handling the competition and all the nom collecting nominations, managing them, working with the juries, uh, promoting uh, the awards, uh, running interviews with the Simon Champions that you can also read on uh, our website. It's also very interesting read. And Tiasha will be taking over for this year. So please remember these two ladies because they're the best resource to ask anything uh, you might be interested to know about the Seaman Champion Award, about the nomination process, um, anything around that. Yeah, and, but of course, everything around Seaman. We are also a very small team, so everyone knows everything and is involved uh, everywhere. Uh, this is a webinar session, so the audience will be able to pose their questions in Q&A or in chat, and I will be helping uh, with uh, handling the questions, but I think both Mart Marcin and Dietmar are such easy guests that, and also tech savvy guests that I will not have much work. So they will both have first uh, initial presentations about their work, you know, what, the, uh, what they received their work for, and of course, what happened since then, what is the latest stuff they're working on. And we hope it will be interesting for you. It will give you some new ideas that you can apply in your own teaching, in your own work, but also serve as an inspiration and motivation to try and apply for their work yourself. So I will not spend much more time on the introduction. I think the most interesting part is the ones that Marcin and Dietmar will present. And of course, we will have time then later on for Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, uh, who wants to go first? Dietmar. OK. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Olga. Um, yeah, hello to everyone, uh, dear colleagues, uh, wherever you are in Krasnoyarsk, in Moscow, in Coventry, in Split, in Warsaw, uh, North Cyprus. Um, great to have um, you with us today. 
Yeah, I will share my screen just a second. Uh, and thank you very much to Olga for this wonderful introduction. Um, do you see? Can you can you see the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. Could you? Could someone write in chat please, yeah. if they can also see the screen? Okay, so teaching with passion is what what should be on the screen now. Um, yes. Yeah. And, yes, and that's that's uh, what it, what it's all about. Um, actually, thank you very much once again for this wonderful um, Seaman Champions Award. Um, it's um, wooden uh, this time, so it's not only sustainable, but it also reminded me at the first moment when I got it of actually a baton, uh, a baton that you get in a relay race. You know, you, you're getting it, you're running with the baton, and then you're handing it uh, on to the next person. And that's also a little bit how it feels, because I think that the most important inspiration for any teacher are other teachers. And uh, here are some of these great teachers that I fortunately met, as Olga said before, um, at the International Management Teachers Academy at IMTA. And that was 11 years ago. And that was at the beginning of uh, the time when I went into academia. And... I think I learned something there um, that, that stuck with me all of the time in between, that teaching is not only about um, conveying information, conveying content, but it's spe especially also about seeing how other people approach things, how other people think, getting to know them as, as, as people and, and getting role models also for yourself. Um, and also, getting to know their their inner attitude uh, towards what they do and i've met so many wonderful people at at imta um who are just uh yeah who are passing on this this this, this flame also this inner flame for teaching um and uh yeah one of them was arshad for example arshad ahmed um and he told us one thing at imta and that was please take a few minutes and write down your personal teaching philosophy. Uh, and this is what I wrote. I just found it now again in, in my folder from Inter. It is 11 years old. Huh? Uh, this is what I wrote for myself then. Um, teaching means not, it, it's not about you, but it's about the people on the other side. So it means stimulating and facilitating the learning of the people who are on the other side. And um, the, the quest that I'm on since that wonderful two weeks that I spent in IMTA is how can I make the learning experience for my students effective? Um, and this is what I wrote 11 years ago for myself, um, creating a non-threatening environment which we, the students and I as a teacher, we see ourselves in par as partners in the learning process. So we would like to create a good learning process together. Um, showing passion for the subject, something that I also learned is the more passion you put in, the, the more positive energy you give, the more positive energy comes back from the other side. Um, I, I felt that passion is addictive and uh, yeah, that's uh, what I'm also trying to do, even if I feel in also in COVID times or if it's online, if I feel a little tired, uh, I try to get all my energy together and, and put it out to the people and, and usually you get a lot back. Uh, the third one, I think, is the, probably the most important one, um, that teaching is not about telling other people what to do or telling what you know, but letting them think for themselves, speak for themselves, write for themselves, act for themselves, and then feel how something feels, how it also feels to struggle with a subject, for example. Um, and that will usually open people also to, to learn more. Um, if you want to tell them something, I, I usually resort to stories. It's usually a bit easier to, to, to relate to them. Um, and, and one thing that I also try to do a lot in my teaching is to show people how parts are interconnected. So to give them the whole picture um, in order to, to, to get connections in their head and, and to see how things are, are related to each other. And last but not least, uh, being a role model in in my behavior towards the people is also something that I got from my role models and that I would like to hand on also to others. Um, so yeah, this was kind of the start, um, being inspired by um, wonderful teachers, thinking about, and I think it made sense to, to really write it down, thinking about 
what is my own teaching philosophy and then trying to 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 use this as a good basis and, and build on that basis and then trying things out uh, uh, i mean at, at Intel, one of the things that i was fascinated with was case studies we, we we learned a lot with case studies there we had some input also from these wonderful colleagues on how to create cases so what i did when i got home and it was virtually on the next day i said okay let's try it out let's write the case uh, and this was my first case and uh, for whatever reason probably uh, due to a lack of um, uh, submissions uh, it was also the, the winner of the case competition in, in the same year of seaman um, and yeah i got a taste of, of, of writing these these materials yourself and i think through thinking through the materials and and, and preparing the materials you get deeper into the topic um, too and i just wrote one case after the other because usually by trying things out you get better um, and now I see that my first cases, I, I, don't, I still don't know why I got this award in, uh, because my first cases were definitely not the best ones. It's getting better and better over time, uh, everything that you practice. I learned, for example, to make my, court, uh, my, my cases shorter. I learned to, to um, make them more controversial so that you can uh, discuss different, dif different uh, sites and opportunities. Um, so it's just a learning doing then, uh, as we've all seen. Yeah, so uh, the other thing is um, not only learning by doing, but also trying to get uh, additional inspiration from outside. So I, I did additional um, learning and teaching um, education at Harvard, for example. One thing that, that was particularly important for me is also to, learning, to learn about the neuroscience of learning. So to learn how the, the brains of other people and my own brain actually function and what you can actually do to make learning more brain friendly. Um, yeah, so that opened up um, a, a bit a new world for me, actually. Um, and uh, what I did then was taking all of these experiences, uh, what I learned from do, trying out things myself, what I learned from other people, what I learned from um, how the brain works, um, what I learned from the role models. And I tried to put that also in kind of a um, theoretical model or theoretical basis for myself. Um, and uh, the core of this is this challenge feedback loop. Um, so it's actually four steps here, challenge, act, feedback, reflect. Um, the, the core idea here is that people learn a lot if they get a challenge that is interesting for them. So not if you tell them what to do, but um, if you give them something to do, which is challenging for them, which is not too easy to do for them, and let them act themselves, let them really try things out, let them do things, let them engage as um, Anders Ericsson, um, who also inspired me a lot um, uh, to, to, to create this cycle here, um, called deliberate practice. So practicing something, really doing something, but also thinking about what you're doing here. Um, then trying to give feedback to people or making sure that they get some feedback on what they're doing and give them the chance to reflect on, on what they have been doing in order to internalize also the learning um, that they have, maybe also correct something if necessary, and then go, go through the next challenge. Well, it sounds a little theoretical of course it's it's kind of the theoretical basis also uh one uh i, I tried different uh, learning and teaching methods to put that into practice and one is this board game um that uh, i actually got the, the semen award uh, for now um it, it actually started out as a board game so i, I produced this, this, this board myself and uh, i tried to to, to uh, create all the, the, the gaming and simulation structure behind. Um, it's basically a quite um, complex, but still easy to play um, market simulation or international market simulation. And uh, we played that usually on a, on a, on a day, so eight hours uh, in several rounds. And it was highly engaging for the students. There were some goals behind getting um, in-depth hands-on experience of the complexity of international business was the basic goal, um, trying to understand what can happen to a company on an international, in an international business environment, trying to have kind of the, um, 
holistic view of the business. So which decisions do you make and how do they play together? Um, and giving the students also a chance to improve their teamwork and group collaboration skills um, on the way. And of course, as I've shown you with the cycle before, learning by trying things out, doing things themselves. Um, so if we go through these four um, steps again, they were challenged to make the decisions themselves. They had to act in groups, make the decision, try to, to um, see what is coming out. And then they got feedback in the simulation. What was happening on the market? What did the other teams doing? Did they sell something on the market? Yes or no. And in the end, I also tried to give some um, yeah, possibilities to reflect either in the group. So we re reflected on the decisions and what happened in the simulation. What do, did we learn from that? And uh, they also usually write a reflection paper afterwards so that they can reflect individually once again about what they learned in this challenge. Yeah, and then I tried to put the whole thing into an online simulation also. So um, try to team up with uh, a programmer or a team of programmers and um, yeah, some colleagues also from my own team. And we tried to make a, an online uh, game out of that. Uh, these are also the decisions that you have to make in the game. So it's about product development, which markets to enter. You can get market research and try to, to um, make your decision more like founded on data. Um, you can you you have to produce something. You can trade with the other groups in this in this simulation model. Um, and there is a market model behind um, that uh, then calculates uh, the outcomes for the teams. And there are several things that can happen to you on those markets, which can happen also on, on, on real markets outside. I don't know, a trade war going on with another uh, country or um, yeah, whatever, boycotts, uh, uh, an economic crisis, uh, many things that can happen in, in the real world too. We do not have a pandemic in there, uh, something that we can maybe still include. Yeah, and, and now we started playing the game online, um, first on, on our own, in our own classes, but then we also started to combine um, courses with, with other universities. I, I did it, for example, with a colleague from New York, um, and we played the game together in the, in the last semester um, with over 100 students from New York and from, from Europe. Um, and try to engage in this transatlantic uh, co teaching collaboration. And that also worked out quite well. Um, here are some of the student voices. And I think um, they show why this kind of works. Um, the first student here says, we were able to feel how the decision-making processes feels and also feel the consequences that uh, are based on, on the decisions that we make. So you see the word feel, three times here. And I think this is what is important here also. Um, it's that people don't only learn something with their um, forehead, but they also feel how it feels to make decisions. They feel how it feels um, to experience the consequences of the decisions. And if you're feeling something, brain science again, neuroscience again, um, it's easier to get something into the long-term memory. Um, yeah, the second student here also says the learning effect comes or is very strong because um, you have to practice things and you make failures uh, during your learning. You can learn from your failures. And I think that's also important that you don't just give people house or give, give people some information how things work, but also let them fail on the way. Let them try things out and learning by the things that do not work. I think um, also is, is, is as important as, as learning from what works. Huh? And uh, yeah, third comment here, we could touch the world of strategy. Yeah? So it's, it's kind of this haptical experience, this um, uh, more, more holistic learning experience that is, that is involved in a, in a situation game, a uh, simulation game like this. Yeah, so far about uh, what, what I did in, in, in a very short time, we would just have 10 minutes. Uh, maybe we have some uh, time to discuss it um, then also afterwards. Um, just a, a, a little um, uh, yeah, uh, look ahead into what comes next. 
actually what I uh, what I felt is that um, it is important to create good learning experiences, but it's also important to create good learning materials that students can use outside um, of the classroom to prepare um, for um, yeah for the class and 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 to learn at home. Um, I wrote several textbooks uh, and I found that the textbooks are usually much too long, um, much too expensive for students and also difficult to understand. Um, so what I did is I tried to do it differently. I first proposed it to some, some publishing houses, but it doesn't really, it didn't really work. So I now tried to uh, create my own publishing house, um, econ size. And I started with my first two, three books now. Um, the idea is to create size books, 100 pages, very approachable learning materials, and very affordable, affordable meaning uh, less than 10 euros for, for a printed version, less than five euros for an electronic version. Um, yeah, and that's my new pet project, um, started out very well. Um, and if any one of you is interested in, in writing a short textbook, please get in touch. Um, yeah. That's it from my side. The only thing that um, I would like to still say is a big thank you to everyone at Siemen, for to Olga, to Jiva, um, to the whole, to Tiasha, to the whole team. Um, you're making an incredible job uh, in bringing us together, in inspiring us um, with uh, giving us role models. Um, and yeah, thank you for this wonderful award, and thank you for your wonderful wor uh, work. Yeah. That's it from my side, and uh, I think we'll hand over to Martin. Dietmar, thank you so much. That was very good. Uh, and it, I, I always like to see the diversity of work and diversity of, of experiences kind of feeding each other and transforming each other. So I think you're such a perfect example of that. We'll have a chance for questions at the end. So if please think of your questions and hold them or write them in chat and we'll have um, a few minutes for that. But now over to Marcin. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can, can you see my screen, please? Yes. Perfect. So I have been uh, honored to receive my uh, Champions Award back in 2019. Um, my award always is behind me here in the middle of my wall, uh, of my background, so it's always with me. <clears throat> and I was very happy and uh, and proud um, uh, to um, uh, to receive that, especially that uh, also Seaman is very important to me. I worked with with them since back in 2014, and then I had the pleasure also to teach at the at tech seminar for two years. And um, so this was, um, uh, this was very, very, very nice and very important uh, meeting uh, award for me and also meeting all those people. Now, I will talk about a little bit differently. I come from, uh, from, <clears throat> uh, from stimulation gaming background and we try to implement uh, uh, new technologies. So we, we are specializing here in my research center with a digital game-based learning. And we pioneered a lot of uh, technologies for the learning perspective. Um, uh, um, so right now, this is mostly mobile uh, VR and also we are working on augmented reality elements. So this is basically what we do. We also produce online games uh, also for learning. So Dietmar, I found your game uh, excellent and I hope I will be also able to play it because I, I'm now very, very interested and I'm really motivated to play your game. So if you could make that happen, that would be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and um, and uh, few, this is a few words about about the introduction, let me move to, to my submission. And my submission was a completely different one because we were, um, we were <coughs> submission for the teaching program based on our own virtual reality game. And also I have to say that I don't work alone. I have my own research set and with very diversified and very nice and young and motivated team of researchers and uh, and we create all those uh, all those products uh, games together 
in this center. So what I what we did is basically create a virtual reality game based project learning project. And this is a funny story how it actually we, I came up with this idea because back in 2016 I was in the uh, <clears throat> in the conference in USA about learning um, methodologies and technologies. And I was talking to other my friend, those professor from USA, who also teaches with simulation games. And did we are talking about technology, and we were arguing that virtual reality is really bad in teaching soft skills acquisition. So it's excellent for hard skills like equipment management and spatial design, but this is very bad for soft skills. And I said, hold my beer, I'll be back in two years. And back into in London in 2018. On the same conference two years later, we presented for the first time our, mm, our project. Yeah. And uh, this, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to create a soft skill acquisition learning um, uh, uh, product program. And this is exactly it. We took uh, on to public speaking skills in the virtual environment, which we found increasingly more important because uh, of deterioration of the traditional uh, <clears throat> traditional skills in public speaking, because more and more activities is transferred is transferred into digital. Whereas we did it over a year of the time, and we were able to secure the the, the funding from the internal grant budget of the university. Uh, and we had uh, and actually the program is uh, it consists the whole learning program. It consists of multiple elements. This is not just virtual reality game. Okay, this is the game is backbone of the system. It has two modes of work. And of course, this is an open design concept. Uh, it can accommodate many future different scenarios. We have also students material. We have also we created also training video material. This is a two hours uh, uh, on, of, of short uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, movies with different aspects on, pr on professional presentation done by the very excellent public speakers. And, uh, and they are closed as a closed YouTube channel and can be distributed as a learning material. And of course, we have also interactive mobile application to, for the students to vote, but this will change in the future. And this is the learning goals, which are specifically targeted at the mm, uh, at learning acquiring soft skills uh, in public speaking. So, in terms of learning through the game system, it's uh, the game has been built in Unity 3D, so it's relatively to to work with and to expand into to the future. It has two learning modes. The first one is a practice mode. And then in this practice mode, students receive the presentation. This presentation is featured in those, in those videos. Um, and basically what they have to do is they have to learn from the master. So there are, uh, so there are those presentations are, are done by the professional public speakers um, uh, uh, and they have to basically get as close to the perfection as the potentially possible. And then now in the second mode, we have the challenge mode. And in this mode, you can upload your own presentation to the, into the game and train this in this virtual environment. And this is where, the, where this mode really shines, when this game really shines, because then you have your own presentation and you have this feeling that you're actually doing this, doing this in front of the people. And of course, <clears throat> And of course, uh, the, the system is quite easy for both the instructor and for the for the student. And uh, we also, while we were designing, we were thinking in mind that not just we're gonna use this for the learning, but anyone that actually want to teach with this system um, uh, is the uh, system. Also provides a lot of feedback. Um, uh, <clears throat> and it in different modes, the structure of the training is. Yeah, it's the same. What is interesting, also, we were designing this in mind both with, uh, with synchronous and asynchronous learning. So you can also basically schedule the, the VR um, uh, as for training, record your session, and then basically share this with your instructor. Uh, in the, from the measurement point, point of view, what do we measure in the game? So students play, they have... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it doesn't matter in which scenario, 
And then basically both in game and afterwards in the reporting, we measure four elements. So first of all is side direction. We look, what, where do you look of every single time? And we also measure how fast do you speed, speak? Uh, so it's not too fast and not too slow. We also <clears throat> uh, measure speaking sound volume. So how loud do you speak? And again, you should not shout. And then so there's like always golden corridor for everything. And of course, we also measure gestures of the. And again, also you you should be making some gestures, but it should not like like you're trying to uh, get away from the swarm of bees. Um, and of course, this is also constantly measured by the by the system. And also, they uh, those icon also appear in the game. I'm sorry, oh, those icons appear also in the game in the corner of the of your vision. Um, and of course, also the behavior of the interactive avatars in the game is, is changing based on your performance. So if they uh, uh, if, if you're doing good job, the, the avatars are more focused and pay attention to you. If you don't make such a good job, they get more distracted and, uh, and do something else instead of listening to you. And on the end, students <clears throat> receive a detailed report of all the elements they did during the gameplay. Also, what is the fifth dimension, there is time. So we basically measure how long they spoke for, for example, every slide, the whole presentation. We have also a, the ability to ask questions in the game. Um, uh, and also the game sessions can be recorded and stored in the cloud. This is how the uh, panel looks like. When you start, you simply choose the uh, choose the gender, uh, um, put the name, what kind of scenarios, is it a practice mode and basically you just push the button start. And this is how the, how the virtual boardroom looks like. Now, we have also included uh, a randomized avatar creation system. How does it mean? It's basically, if you look at this, there are different avatars, male, female, also different nationality and, and ethnicity. And we want to, to be the diverse group of people and also sit in the random pattern. So there's not every time you log in, there could, would be probably a different setting system. So you have to basically pay attention to who is in front of you. And of course, well, how we did is basically we have base models for avatars and then how they dressed, what the ethnicity um, and what they're sitting is, um, is, is automatically generated. Uh, and always we have always uh, different, we have mixed of different nationalities, um, um, also gender balance and so on. So there is, um, so we wanted to have this uh, built in into, the, into our simulation. And um, what are the basic lessons learned from the from this? Because we, of course, we we did this. Uh, it was quite new, and of, of and then and we had a lot of, of course, both problems but also challenges in design. This so first of all, spatial design for VR environments is different because you have to do think with space. Thinking what well, like um, in a traditional more online learning is basically you click on it on the elements and basically you have to think about UI and how you design it. In virtual reality, you have to think about the space because you are the interface in the game. And how do you organize the space? And the space has to have meaning. Uh, and this is difficult because there's completely different design approach uh, to this. And then of course, for, interestingly, we have developed, and this is was majority of our work was, we have basically designed the measurement and feedback system in this game from the, from the scratch. And we had many versions of this. And how do you measure? How do you display this for the as a form of feedback, both in-game and afterwards? Was very, it was quite a lot. Mm, uh, for example, we have to write our own module to, to listen how fast you speak in Polish, because it was difficult. It's like a little bit more like in Chinese. Um, and then, of course, there is still a cyber sickness problem. Um, and there are, of course, some, some, some solutions so far, like virtual noses and so on. But still, um, around one fifth of the population uh, feels like the mild symptoms of cyber sickness in, 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 in the game. So you have to design with the mind. So what we did is basically you are, you are on your own height. 
uh, in the game. There is no so much movement in the game, so you don't feel sick. Uh, so we were thinking about that, this elements where we were designing the system. And of course, flexible design for learning. And because we were hit by the pandemic later on when we are designing, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, what is this good, de good decision? Uh, because um, if you think about, because this is this program is based on modular design for both synchronous and asynchronous learning. So you can take like some one small piece or you can take the whole, or you can combine this. And this was very good because then if even if something changes like pandemics comes, you can basically move to the asynchronous learning and then it's, it's, it's fine again because uh, the VR sets can be easily uh, disinfected and you can just have one person in the room. So it's safe. And of course, we build the system in a semi-open design. So we want to have, um, and, and do, do we want to have more scenarios in the future. And also what is then our next step, and we already started to work on this, is basically, because technology changed, if you know what I mean, look at the, uh, at the Facebook horizon and what they are doing with this. And we're thinking also with the distributed VR environments, so for example, what we want to do that in this boardroom, there would be some avatars, but also like three, four others people can join if they want to as an audience and give the feedback to the players. So they can want to basically move to the multiplayer version as well. And we also were, were looking into, for have, can we use um, um, a Facebook Horizon SDK for this, but this is tricky because of the unfortunate uh, policy of Facebook towards um, uh, towards the uh, data security and ownership. And of course, with next step also, we want to look into augmented reality, uh, which is also could be interesting potential for learning, especially that we are, uh, that we can build then the systems um, uh, uh, and then uh, the system you can basically distribute it to the students' phones. And this is another also interesting prospect uh, of, 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 of learning. The problem with augmented reality is how do you convey uh, more complex knowledge through this, not just simple, not just models like, I don't know, simple models, but more complex elements. So we battling with those elements and hopefully we will find some solution. So thank you. I hope Olga, I was not, I was not uh, evaluating my time. <laughs> you were perfect, <laughs> just on time, actually. Thank you so much. I think Marcin, this is also, you know, quite a good foundation for education process moving into metaverse. That everything is being discussed so much now, and now you are already using the VR and you are working on augmented reality and avatars and everything. So I, th I think it's just such a uh, good platform to continue and deepen that, which it will come yeah. here. I mean, there's no, no way we can avoid it, I think. And for, for kids, for students, they learn it very fast. They grow with that. You know, for teachers, that might also still take some more time. I mean, I still remember that flock of birds flying at me uh, during the simulation. You know, that was something completely surreal. You know, you don't expect it. But then again, it's something new to learn, something new to experience. Dismar, any comments, any questions? I, I just fascinated, my... Martin, uh, by what you're, what you're doing. Um, this uh, opens up a, a completely new world for me. Um, and if, if I may, I, I would already have a first question, actually. I mean, you're, you're um, really Please at the forefront ahead. of uh, VR, AR, of all these new technologies, uh, where at least I am light years behind. Um, where, do you see, where do you see the future in the next few years in, in, in these technologies for us, for, for, uh, for teachers and, and for learning processes? Yeah? What, what's, what's the... Um, yeah, the, the, the most well, here, uh, here's the problem. Yeah. The, the, the best applications for the for the future that you would see from from your expertise. So I, I have some, let's say, see, but also I see it and I, I fear it a little bit because you mentioned Olga, you mentioned metaverse. And the problem with, with Facebook is that they have very specific approach, let's be very precise, very specific approach towards security and ownership of data. And for the moment, 
the answer is simply, should I, for example, use the Facebook meta for learning? And my simple answer is say, no, you shouldn't. Why? Because the problem is you don't own anything there. Everything which you do in there, Facebook owns. If does not, this does not change us, we will have to find another solution. But if we look at the, the future and also the trends, we will more or less, especially partially, move toward more, more distributed learning environments. And one of those, this direction is also virtual reality. So telepresence, not just sitting in front of the computer and listening, for example, to the hybrid or fully online classes, but also being present there. Um, also, Dietmar, I must say that I had an idea during your presentation about build, building the first live VR case, like in VR for, uh, for management teaching. And I will try to think about this. Uh, uh, and I will have a question later for you about this. And then if the, and the problem is that um, there is still a lot of elements, distribution of, uh, of, of still, let's say this technology is rather expensive to run. Okay, this becomes cheaper and cheaper, but now if you have 2,000 or 3,000 or even 10,000 students, now imagine you have to buy for them VR sets or make them VR sets. Okay, it's few hundred euros or a few hundred US dollars, but it's still additional cost on top of the education. And then you, how much infrastructure you as a university have to run behind, it's either your own, infrastructure, or you have to rent this infrastructure for this large, large technological giants, which is another layer of problems because who owns the data, how this looks like. So this is another topic. So this is a very complicated stuff. And we will, as we saw like tremendous jump in digitalization in the last three years, for most, for many universities, they did like more in last two, three years than did, they did in land 20. Then we will probably keep moving in this direction, uh, which will completely change, for example, competition between universities because you can now learn from anywhere. You can be in New Zealand and, and train in UK uh, if you want to. So this will come up, maybe change, but this is still a lot of technical legal problems to be solved before we even start. Solutions like ours is localized. We can of course easily transfer data by sending you basically links to the materials and programs. And you can download this and use it if you have your own VR set and people wanted to use this as instructors. But using more distributed environments is still, is still a, a challenge for, for them. It's not just technological change, it's a classical adopt ad adoption challenge. Sounds super interesting. Thanks a lot, Magic. Thank you. I have a question. Do you see differences and what are the key differences in using simulations, using the VR to different types of audiences? Where do you think it works maybe better or worse? What are the adjustments that you need to make as a faculty or maybe there is no difference? There is because first of all, you have to, well, adapting any technology requires additional learning from, from us as teachers. And also it requires accommodation, new technologies, new techniques. This is like Dietmar built his game. He built the program around his game and this is exactly what we did. We build game and we build program around the game, but it's different. Um, it, every technology, in, in every technology adoption, it's limitations that play more into the, our the teaching field that actually what the potential are, is. And this is in, in, in case of VR is very simple. You have to have, uh, you have to have, um, uh, you have to have VR sets, you have to have computers, you have to have space and place or ability to transfer this to your student. And, and this is the biggest limitation. Um, um, I cannot force my students to buy VR sets, but I have few of them and we have VR spaces that you can basically come reserve as a student and play. We have also different games, VR games, serious games for, for example, our lawyers 
that solve crimes um, uh, in virtual crime scene investigation. We have CSI war, CSI Kozminski. <laughs> And uh, we call it uh, eternally. <laughs> and then we have, um, uh, and, and then, but this creates additional challenges. What is on the plus side, it creates a completely unique learning experience for the students. And for many of them, this is important. Uh, 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 and, and this is the plus, but there is a lot of limitation and also how we work with this. It gives us potential, but it more in the beginning, especially is the limitations that are, that are important. You have to learn how to deal with cyber sickness, but somebody drops to the ground and suddenly starts seizing. What do you do as a teacher? Um, and we also, we have to train people, instructors in first aid, how they should behave. Of course, this is a rare case. It's like 0.002% of the population have uh, 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 have this problem, but still, it can happen in the classroom, unfortunately, uh, and so on. So every every technology creates uh, problems, but also creates a lot of potential. Um, uh, Natalia Makuha from Russia has a question, Marcin, to you, but I think it's also applicable to Dietmar. If you have experience in using different business games in one course to develop key competences. Well, I do. This was part of my PhD back in 2013. Uh, I used as an experimental elements for using multiple games uh, in the same classroom for different purposes. The experiment I did for my PhD is basically they were playing traditional business simulation game in the group setting. And on top of this, they were, were able to invest in this game. So I basically wrote an additional game as an investment game on top of the business simulation game. And I let them brutally speculate on their own stocks. Uh, which is unfortunately the reality today, <laughs> uh, and uh, and this was and my my goal was to make students pay more attention to reading uh, reading boring tables with numbers, which are usually produced by the simulation games in form of financial statements of the, and this worked uh, because in order to speculate effectively, you have to crunch the numbers. <laughs> but I don't want to also maybe uh, more questions also. Dietmar, do you have any other ideas? Yeah, um, it's again um, amazing what you're doing, Martin. Um, it's, uh, I, I think seeing the complexities is something that is really important for students. So having different levels, like this is our business decisions and this is the outcome. This is the decisions of the investors and, and how, they th how these are um, like tied in. Um, excellent. Now, I don't have um, experience in, in using several um, online simulation games uh, in, in, in one course. What I usually do is I, I like to combine teaching methods. So in one course, first, for example, starting with case studies, then having a simulation game and then having them work on a real life project so that they like go one step by the other and can build on the knowledge that they had before. Um, but this this combination um, of, 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 of several technologies in one course is something also due to a lack of, of, of technological competence. I think that's also something that is, is very important and is, that Margin has as, as a professor, like contents competence and, and pedagogical competence and technological competence. I think this, this is something that is still very rare. So we would probably have to work more in teams in future um, to, to get people with the different competences together here. You know, Dietmar, you kind of made the smooth transition to the next question, to the next question that Slajana asked, and that was exactly what would be your message to the professors who are very reluctant to adopt new technologies and techniques? Yeah, so one is working in teams, perhaps, right? But maybe you could elaborate more on that or give uh, some additional advice. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, I, I'm one of those professors who is who are more reluctant. I mean, not not maybe to try things out, but I know I know that I, I don't have competence there. Um, it's it's difficult for me um, to to uh, to to work with all these new technologies. So what I do is um, I trust just try to outsource. <laughs> I try to get together with other people who are more knowledgeable in this. Um, so I'm. 
I, I can do the content part and then I go together with, with someone who is, or the pedagogical part also go together with someone who, who can cover the technological part. I don't think that everyone needs to, to, to do everything. Uh, I mean, these are really deep competences that you have to develop. You just need to be open to collaborate as in other fields. Um, and I think also again, um, collaboration platforms uh, and institutions like Seaman um, are um, a great, uh, yeah, a great possibility to get people together and uh, to join forces. Mark, yeah. what would you say? Well, yes, it's it's true. We also collaborate. We also, it's impossible to, we already have some own, let's say, software development um, uh, teams, but we usually also cooperate with external companies. Um, I, I just always said because we are working at the research level very closely with the video game industry and we are sometimes ask them please 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 make game for us and they do in most of the cases uh, but and of course but we work with them already with on the research and development um, elements so we have we always tie build a close connections to the industries and this is very important as well especially in the technological area on our side, the critical element is exactly what Dietmar said. You have to be open to cooperation and you have to basically coordinate people from different areas and try to bring them together. We also not, uh, for this pub, for the VR game, we, we are not specialists in public speaking, but we had, we, we, we call, we, we ask colleagues from, from, from communications and do, who do specialize in, in public speaking to come on board and they provided us with, with the unique skills and knowledge needed in order to be a high quality learning experience for the students. And again, this always calls to the new areas and to the new uh, new learning. But the key is for me that it's a it's a con it's a constant learning, uh, and you have to and the, and what is important is that unfortunately this brings you constantly out of your comfort zone, <laughs> because sometimes I have to solve the problems that I have no clue about on the beginning. And of course, but it's a process. You learn about this, you go deeper, and then you try to do your best on the end. And it's also iterative process. One lesson is this, if you, no matter if you do a case study or if you do a game, never expect that the first version would be the best. <laughs> no, in many cases, we are deleting the first versions and starting over when we brought it for the first time, for example, in front of the students and they were hating it. <laughs> So this is this is a process, and it's um, um, but in my my opinion, it's worth it, um, uh, and it's um, and this is also um, this is also critically important to uh, to to move and learn constantly, um, uh, and bring for me it's important to bring me out of my comfort zone. Maybe I like it as I'm a little bit sadomasochistic about this. <laughs> Uh, we have one more question from Natalia Wojciechowska and about five minutes to go. Uh, so maybe very quickly. So Natalia is asking, could you both tell a little bit more about the technicalities of your initiative? So you mentioned already more about the ideas and results, but she's interested more in the technical part as well. Maybe a few key points. And then Natalia, if you're interested to learn more, you could reach out directly to Dietmar and Marcin, and I'm sure they will be happy to tell any of the participants who are curious to learn more about the technical part in more detail. Yeah, but maybe just a few key points about the technical. I, I can be fast here because I have no idea about the technical background. <laughs> so all, well, all you I created the board. Yeah, right. Also, right, you have the so, board. So basically, um, and, and I did everything myself in the beginning with an Excel file to, to create the market model, etc. Um, and, and with a sheet and paper to, to show how things work. Um, and then you, you just have to tell it to a programmer who understands how to, to, uh, uh, to make a, a technical platform out of that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's less about understanding the tech, technological basis, but um, really just being able to explain to another person uh, what you would like to have and this other person would do it. And the, the, the most difficult thing is actually what Martin said before. 
it's not having something programmed. Uh, this is something that is rather easy yeah, to say, okay, this is what I would like to have. This is the logic behind. This is what you put in. That is, this is what you sh should come out. Uh, the, the more difficult thing starts when you try to test things and you see it doesn't work. So whenever you have a partner, a programming partner, for example, to, to, to create something like this, make it a longer term partnership, not a one off partnership where you just tell them what to do and then they deliver something, but arrange with them that it will take some time that you will go through several semesters and we'll have it as an iterative process um, so that you can adapt things because in the adaptation, things are really getting better. So that's very important also in the, in the, uh, on, the on the technical side of the collaboration. Well, also, I also would point out what Sladana wrote in the in the chat. It, it's yes, to some extent, it, 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 because she asked, "Is this the trial of error, and we shouldn't be afraid of it?" Right. Yes and no, because yes, it's a trial of error, but you can it's a it's a learning learnable skill to build uh, things, basically a project management. <laughs> And also there are design game design courses again also a learnable skill um, and uh, and you it is a trial and error and you have to in many cases swallow a bitter pill because you look at your child that you worked for the last two years and ever, and nobody likes it <laughs> except of you uh, but usually uh, you have to do this but on the end the result is so much better. Uh, and uh, in terms of what the technical background is, the technical, let's say, is, is, is yes, on the beginning is mostly a design work with Excel files, with, with graphs. And then is like two critical skills. One, what Dietmar said, you have to be able to communicate to the technical team, what do you want, but in the way that they understand because they speak completely different language than usually pe other people are. And, uh, and there are even memes and jokes about this. Uh, what, 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 what you wanted and what you have, what you got. Uh, and this is, uh, the, so this is the first skill that I learned and this was critically important for me is to, to talk with different languages, to talk to the technology team in their own language, to talk with the designers, and then teachers would all their own language, so they understand, and they receive a very clear message: what is it about, what I get, what's the problem with this, and this increases the efficiency of the production process enormously. And the second element is very simple: is, is project management for IT, basically. <laughs> so, and, and there are plenty of courses online, and and plenty of of ability to to to, te to learn that. Um, and uh, and then this this rabbit hole is very deep. I'm I'm so deep that you cannot even see me behind. So in my, in a, for example, right now I do way more IT project management than I do teaching, um, because of the profile of my work right now. I still teach, but this is like ten percent, and the ninety percent is pro IT project management. <laughs> Basically, uh, so the, it's a, it's a. Uh, they like teaching, uh, and then the phone, but this is the price I have to pay for in order to bring new technologies and new solutions to the, to the table. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you. I also see a lot of good words coming in in the chat. Uh, I posted uh, a couple of links that might be relevant for participants. One is on the Seaman Champion Award. So on that page, you can read about the nomination process, the criteria. You can also learn who the past winners are. Um, and I posted the link also about IMTA, our International Management Teachers Academy, that will take place in June in person. Super highly recommended. In if person. you haven't been there, go there. If you have been there, go there again. <laughs> and and Blade is wonderful in June. It's one of the best places, best lakes in the world. Oh uh, yes. Uh, and yes, as Dietmar mentioned, we have the opportunity for alumni to join a different disciplinary track. You know, so that that is also something very valuable. So Dietmar Marchian, any final words? Go to Blade, drink excellent <laughs> Slovenian wine next to the beautiful lake. There is nothing to add here. <laughs> and, and while here, you can also visit Dietmar, who is just half an hour drive from here across the border in Austria, by the way. 
So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for questions. Thank you for participation. We will have the recording posted also on our YouTube channel and on social media. So uh, you can share it with colleagues who might be interested. Thank you, Jiva, for organizing everything and for running the awards. And Tiasha, good luck for this year taking it over. Thank you so much. See you. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank it was a you. pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>